So if you would, just sit erect where you are so that the energy can flow to you and through you. So breathe in to the count of four and exhale. Breathe in. Blow out anything that doesn't feel like God. Let it go. Breathe in. And breathe out and out. Imagine, if you will, in the very center of your body, a ball of light. And feel it twirling around and getting bigger and bigger. And feel that light. Consciously raise that light as it grows and grows. Raise it up through your body, through the area of your heart up, through your throat, through your the top of your head and feel that light expand out. And feel it incorporating into the universe, into source, becoming more and more powerful. Now bring it back, bring it back within your body. And feel that healing energy radiating out into every cell. The healing, the peace, the love. Filling your body, every single cell beyond even the perimeter of your body. knowing that this light is doing its thing, doing its healing, every organ, every function, every action and reaction is in harmony with the divine creative spirit. Just feel that settling in, energizing you in that ball of light, rotating, rotating, sending off energy, sparks of energy wherever you go, sending that love and that healing to anyone that is within your radius. Knowing that you are a unique expression in the mind of God. Radiating out that love and that peace. Breathe in, keeping this energy, this power within you. Come back into this room now, knowing that you have had a holy moment. So it is. Ah. Hello, everybody. It always feels like family reunion when we come here. We were members for a long time and then got called someplace else, but we love each of you. So today we're going to talk about the four stages of spiritual growth. And uh, it's really... We go through this. It's sort of, remember the book, Seven Passages? We're going to go through these healing stages whether we like it or not. It's just part of existence. I was inspired for this message by Michael Beckwith, who's the founder of the Agape International Spiritual Center. I think it's in Los Angeles. And he introduced this concept uh, in in his teaching in the four stages of spiritual growth and development. 
Now, I don't know about you, but I have to go through this. I've done it all my life. We've just learned. We have these experiences. It's just stages that we go through. But also, I can do these four stages in a millisecond. Let me tell you what I mean. It sort of goes along with the daily word today. I have a friend that um, we work with uh, in spiritual uh, efforts, and she is the most generous, kind, loving, magnanimous human being you ever want to meet. But dadgummit, she is the most assertive woman you'd ever want to meet. And sadly, that was one of my lessons I had to contract to learn, to overcome, is how to deal with assertive women, uh, women. because my mother was a champion at that. Uh, She wasn't necessarily loving and magnanimous and kind, but that is my personal button. I don't know about you. you, you probably have your own button of something else. And then there is a teacher there ready to help you overcome that lesson. I promise. And with my friend, this is what I go through, all these four stages of uh, spiritual development. In a millisecond, my button is pushed and I react. And then I think, wait a minute, this is not about you. This is just her being who she is and you're being through who you are. It's nothing personal. That's just her way. And so I go through all these stages, bam, 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 bam. And then before she even finishes her sentence, I'm back in a loving place with her because that's my responsibility, my lesson to learn. She's just being her. It's sort of like we learn these lessons all over again, and it's not just the millisecond that I have with my friend, that we learn these lessons over time. And then we think we've learned them, but ah, ah, ha ha no. We finished, and we think we're good. I got this one. Uh Uh-uh. It's going to come back around in a prettier package and present itself again. Do you really have this lesson? And then another even prettier package, and it comes, and it gotcha. You remember Woody Allen? This is what Woody Allen has to say. Now that I'm rich, I fail with a better class of women. (laughs) So that's sort of how this story goes. Now, I'm going to talk about these four stages of development. And when I looked at them, and uh, Michael Beckwith has nothing to say about that, but I'm interested in the chakras, and I noticed that these are connected to different chakras in our body. So I'm just going to throw that little bit in there that really has nothing to do with anything. So we begin with the Tumi stage. Uh, That, to me, is connected to the root chakra. That's the uh, most primitive part of our cells, our physical selves. That's where we operate from when we uh, repeat the lessons that our parents have taught that we're still in the religion that they told us was right, or what our tribe said how to handle money, that we approach it that way, and we never begin to think for ourselves. So that's what that means to me. And this is what Michael Beckwith has to say about the to-me consciousness. It's the stage we experience ourselves at the effect of the people and the circumstance of life that as long as we're making others responsible for our circumstance, we're giving away our power and limiting our ability to make the necessary changes. In the to-me stage, everything that happens to me is out there. It's somebody else's fault. And then you live life at the whim of other people. Uh, In my own to-me stage of growth, this is what happened to me. Uh, I was about 40, and I'd already been studying metaphysics for about 20 years, and my first husband passed away. And the insurance money came, 
and it was like unlimited funds. It was more money than I ever had in my life. And I opened a restaurant. And I closed a restaurant. <laughs> and I, during the process of failing in my learning opportunity, you know, I expected not only was it somebody else's fault somehow, that there were, there were legitimate people that maybe took advantage of me. As I grew, I realized those people were my teachers. They gave me lessons I had to learn. But I also expected the rescue to come out from out there somewhere. I didn't know that I had it within me to rescue myself. I think I expected Jesus Christ to ride up on his white horse and save my butt. <laughs> didn't happen. I, I think I know where Jesus was during all of this. There's a New Yorker cartoon, and there's these missionary guys knocking at the door. A lady opens the door, and they say to her, Have you found Jesus? But back over her shoulder, there's a lump in the drapes. If you look down at the bottom, there's these little sandal toes peeking out from the drapes. I, I think that's where Jesus was when I was going through this. I think he was hiding behind the drapes saying, oh, oh, not my problem, not my karma. <laughs> so I had to rescue myself. I didn't exactly rescue myself. I struggled with it for a long time after I passed that episode. Uh, and then life took me kicking and screaming into the next stage of my spiritual development. All those metaphysics that I had studied for those 20 years really didn't change anything that I experienced. I still had to learn the lesson that I contracted to learn before I jumped into this bag of bones. And we all do that. We all have a lesson that we're contracted to experience. And our villain is really someone that loved us enough to be the villain, to be the teacher, to, so that we could learn our lessons. So this is what Michael Beckwith has to say about the next stage of spiritual development, the stage of our journey, our sojourn on Earth. Earth school, bummer. He says, we're not victims of circumstance, but rather the creators of it. This was a new concept to me, even though I studied all this stuff. He said it's a building or rebuilding phase of the ownership of life. It's a powerful step on the path when we begin to take responsibility for ourselves. This phase often sneaks up on you and you really don't know enough to be aware of the signs. You just know that you've got to take charge. I remember right after this, I had a little day planner and I printed out uh, this slogan. I didn't know as much about what it meant as I do now, but the slogan was, if it is to be, it's up to me. So I knew the flaw was me. I was the one that made the mistakes and I had to find my way out and take responsibility of what I had created. So now I, it was time to get into new thought principles. Now, earlier I talked about studying metaphysics for 20 years. I had to, then I went into new thought principles. And you think it might be the same, but there's a great deal of difference. Metaphysical, for me, I'm speaking from my own experience, not anybody else's, but when I became enamored with this concept and the, all the things that metaphysical entails, and, and some of you may have experienced this too, when you first get in, you get so excited and you go to all the workshops and, and you study about reincarnation and a ghost or uh, you go to mediums, you go to psychics and all, all of this. Honey, I was the queen of woo-woo for 20 years. It didn't help one speck 
in the in my situation in my uh, education. Uh, but then, after it was over, we happened to go into we. I had met Glenn during the middle of all this terribleness, and we got married, and we started going to Unity of Arlington. That was our first foray um, as a couple into regular church going. And back then, we were young. Edwin Gaines was young. And so we went to one of her workshops, and she was small potatoes back then, but she really laid it out. She had some good physical things to begin to implement in our lives to where we could go from surviving to thriving. And then uh, you hear about this new thought principle, change your mind and change your life. So we went from, I went from the metaphysical into serious study and implementing all these things that you're learning here at Center of Unity. Uh, so my rebuilding phase came with selling my home and my cars to pay my debts, which were way beyond the money I had lost. Uh, I not only lost my cars and my home, the restaurant, but I'd lost the respect of anybody that knew me, period. That was it. I was written off, and deservedly so. It, it was a lesson that I had to go through, and we ultimately climbed our way out of it. So slowly, I began to analyze how energy works, what these principles mean. For instance, uh, what you learn here is about tithing, that it is part of being prosperous. Before, tithing was like you negotiated with an authoritarian god, and you begged your way in and out. But now I, I came to learn that that's just, it's teaching you about trust and knowing that God's got you. That's another thing that there's a difference in, the out there philosophy. Trust is a little bit about something out there. Knowing is from here. So we're in this process of the by me situation, the by me stage of our journey and taking control, we begin to learn that. Also about healing. One of the things that we learn about healing, which is really big in Unity Churches and uh, any other New Thought Church, what we, we go to others like the prayer practitioner, the prayer chaplain, or the minister, and we ask for prayer because when we're the one in need of prayer, we have so much anxiety that we're putting up an energetic roadblock that keeps our voice from flowing out into the universe. Whereas the prayer practitioner or the chaplain or the minister isn't bound up by that anxiety. They simply know. They know that God heals, they've seen it, so they can issue the word for healing and it rides in on this lovely vehicle of energy. Um, it's like what Jesus said in the Bible, in the, in the Lord's Prayer. He did not say, he said, this is not how to pray, but this is what to, wait, I'm getting this wrong. <laughs> The, the, these are the wor not the words to pray. It is not what you pray, but it's how you pray. In the Lord's Prayer, what does he say? Give us this day. Forgive us our debts. He's issuing a polite command into the universe because he's come from a place of knowing. So there's a difference there. And you learn these things as you go along trying to control your life in the by me stage of your involvement. So bit by bit, awareness crept in and we're ready then for the next stage. The next stage is the through me stage. So you're graduating a little bit. So this is what Michael Beckwith has to say about that. When we've worked hard at developing skills in any activity or endeavor, 
from music to sports to mathematics, there's a moment when we cross over from pure focused effort to a feeling of grace and flow with what we're doing. It's an important step in that stage of development. We may have been building skills uh, and trying to do the same thing over and over and over until one day we go from playing the music to suddenly feel as though the music is playing through us. So that's what happens. We begin to, as we've taken control and making decisions and studying to get to the next stage, then we have that feeling of this energy flowing through us that you are a channel. I know that I've often, and probably here in other sermons, but I talk about how the creative individual is usually talented in more than one gift. I think of Tony Bennett. He sings. We all know him for singing, but he's also an artist. And, but that's how the, whole, the divine creative energy flows through his filter. If you're sitting here in, in this congregation right now, you may have read at least 500 books getting you from point A to point B. And each one expresses through whatever the author's filter is, just as though you are a divine expression of God and God is flowing through you and however you are is important. I think about um, the difference between The Course in Miracles, which I find quite rigid. Glenn loves The Course in Miracles. And then there's Neil Donald Walsh at the opposite end of the spectrum. Uh, you don't get any looser, goosier than Neil Donald Walsh. Glenn talks about, he was on the third Conversations with God book and suddenly realized that God must be a liberal Democrat. <laughs> because that was Neil Donald Walsh's point of view. But you see, each expression resonates with someone in a different way. And we need all those expressions of creativity expressing as you are. We need that voice. You know, even the difference between Glenn and I, he's, uh, I'm a little loosey-goosey myself, and he's more staying on the strict unity Christianity path, and his, we're just two different people. But I resonate with someone, and he resonates with someone. So in the through me consciousness, what we do, we go through a, a change. We start out wanting to be significant in the raising of the consciousness of mankind. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's, it's not selfish or egotistical. We just have this desire to do something significant. And so then you go through that surrender and you, you go through, uh, get to a stage where you're suddenly, rather than putting out the, say you're an author, you're putting out these words and you're proud of what you've written, and suddenly you go through this stage of humility that the creative force is expressing through you. And then you are significant. It's not about you any longer. It's about how you're serving. So then the next stage of the spiritual development is the asme stage. And this is, oh, I forgot to tell you the chakra for the through me stage. Remember when we were meditating, we sent that energy through us? I think of the through me stage as the heart chakra, the love center of our body. I think of it as the liaison chakra because we take the three lower chakras, which are about physical energy, bring it up through that love, and then raise it up through the spiritual chakras. So that's uh, 
Now back to the Azmi stage, that's a crown chakra. To me, the crown chakra is where you go when you go in prayer and you uh, talk to God and you converse with the God as you, as you will, trying to get the information. And this is what Michael Beckwith says about that. As we allow our individual expression to merge completely with the energy that we are experiencing or creating in the world, we realize that we're actually a part of the infinite creative force of the universe, which is expressing and experiencing itself as the individualized as me. Now, I always love what Eric Butterworth says about uh, our being part of the whole. He says that we are a crumb in the cupcake of God. That's what he says. <laughs> just, just saying. But then, and you also, you've heard a million times that we are like a drop in the ocean. We have all the attributes of the ocean in this drop, but we're not the whole ocean. And that's how we are with the divine, the allness of the universe. We have all those attributes that we can use. Uh, and when we come from a place of knowing that about ourselves and accepting that we are a divine expression of the mind of God. So this is an illustration about how that works in the Azmi consciousness. And you've heard this story. If you've ever been in another church, anywhere, I don't care what kind of minister you are, New Thought, Evangelical, a priest or whatever, you've bound to have used this story. And it's a story about the drought in the land. And so they send up this story, the uh, holy people to the mountaintop to pray for rain. So the minister is up there, the Native American uh, shaman is up there. And so the minister is praying to God, to a God out there, you see. And he's got this beseeching prayer, oh, please God, let there be rain in the land, let it nourish the ground, let it bless the people. I humbly ask you for this gift. No rain, okay? The Native American shaman is praying from God, his knowing, his connectedness with all that is. And his prayer is simply, rain. And it does. So that's the difference between the knowing that you are part of all that is and thinking that like we began in the beginning of our search that God is out there and it's not God is in here God is in there and there and there and there in this stand God is in everything so when you get to this to, in order to get to this situation. It's a little like being married. So this is what happens. You get married. You, you meet somebody and you begin to court each other and you get close, you put on your best face, you wear your best clothes, and you're just so nice and you begin to have these conversations and, and you find you have an in-depth soul connection, so sure enough, you get married. So then you move into your first place together and uh, you put your things in your side of the closet, your spouse puts things in their side of the closet. You have your drawers, they have their drawers. You go to your job, they go to their job. You come home, you do your chores. Hopefully the other person's doing their chores. Uh, and then, and so you do all this and you, then you evolve and you don't make decisions alone anymore. You, what happens? You wake up one morning and you're really married. 
You are one unit. And you don't really know how or when that happens. But that's when you communicate with the divine and you begin to know the divine energy, you have that connection and you can talk with God at all times. Uh, and so then you're one with God. and You don't make decisions alone anymore. You go to this empty room, uh, symbolically empty room, <laughs> in your brain and you go in there and you say your prayer and you speak to God like, like an intimate friend, which God is. There is nothing more intimate than being inside you. And so now you're living in the asme stage. But remember, you get to start this all over. As long as you're living life on earth, that lesson is going to come back in that prettier package and bite you on the butt. Say, do you really understand the lesson? And it's going to keep going on and keep going on, and then you will have learned your lesson, and life gets easier and easier as you negotiate this lesson. Whatever button is being pushed within you, you can recognize that that's part of the lesson you contracted when you came into this body. And the others are out there, your teachers. And so you begin to live as that oneness with God. So I want to close now with this uh, quote from Marianne Williamson. This is what she says. We ask ourselves, who am I? to be brilliant or gorgeous or talented or fabulous. Actually, who are you not to be? You're a child of God. Your playing small does not serve the world. forth into this week, let us remember our prayer for protection. The light of God surrounds us. I am the light of God. The love of God enfolds us. I am the love of God. The power of God protects us. I am the power of God. The presence of God watches over us. I am the presence of God. Wherever we are, God is, and all is well. See you next week.